Okay, so for several years I've been experimenting with different types of optics and uh, lasers and this setup I've been working on for on and off for quite a few years uh, and it's basically in a nutshell it's a entanglement source which uses two crystals of a, a material called barium borate, beta barium borate, you can see them there. So the crystals are purchased, were purchased online several years ago by myself. And beta barium borate is a very interesting material because it turns out if you pump it with a laser of a specific uh, wavelength, in this case 405 nanometers, you can generate two pairs of entangled quantum entangled photons now this process is uh, very interesting uh, but it has limitations so the main limitation is is that the um the efficiency of the generation of the photons is very weak i think it's something like one in every uh, billion uh, or so um ultraviolet photons get converted into uh to um, 810 nanometer photons, infrared, near infrared photons. So the process is not very efficient, but if you use a powerful enough laser, you can create um, enough photons that you can uh, statistically uh, count them. So this is very interesting because it is able to generate states which are entangled with one another. And what that means is if you know in a nutshell about quantum entanglement you know that if you affect the polarization of one state of the entangled photon pair you will affect the complementary state of the pair so by entangled pairs we mean that the laser the 405 nanometer photons from the laser this ultraviolet laser source are coming into a crystal which is in this a black part here, the two crystals facing one another. And what happens is the photons from the laser have, uh, intrinsically, they have two modes, uh, horizontal modes or H modes and vertical modes or V modes. And what the entanglement process does, it essentially takes um, the um, H and V modes that are in superposition and uh, converts them into uh, two separate photon beams, which are themselves in superposition. And what that means is uh, we do not know uh, um, prior to measuring which photon will be in the H mode and which photon, photon from the initial uh, photon source will be in the V mode. And if we measure one in the H mode using this beam splitter, if it turns out that one of the photons out of uh, the billions and billions that we use is converted into a H-mode photon and it's detected as a H-mode photon, we will know automatically that its complementary partner will be detected as a V-mode uh, photon. But there's no way of knowing a priori uh, which one will be H and which one will be V. And so this is actually very interesting to exploit uh, for generating random numbers we know if we have a coin uh, a coin any coin and we do a, um, a coin toss we uh, generate uh, you know we have a 50 50 chance of getting heads or tails uh, but in reality we could actually classically if we knew all of the conditions the pre, uh, initial conditions uh, you know the wind uh, speed the uh, temperature of the of the room the fluctuations uh, caused by the atoms in the coin the um, the position of the hand of course and the orientation of the coin flip itself if we had a big fancy supercomputer we could run a simulation on all of these parameters and we could in principle predict every time which uh, coin which head of the coin will land heads or tails so that's uh, actually possible in classical systems but in quantum systems, actually, that's not true. Uh, if if we had all of the initial conditions of the of the laser, the temperature that the laser is running at, the voltage that's being supplied to the laser, even the the you know the power output of the laser, 
uh, it's impossible uh, that by um, virtue of uh, quantum mechanics to know a priori uh, what state will be uh, the photon that enters this beam splitter and this photodetector and what um, state this um, uh, beam splitter and photodetector will um, detect. It's impossible to know. And this is because uh, quantum um, processes, uh, particularly in states of quantum superposition, but also due to the uncertainty principle and so on, are irreducibly uh, random. We could, if we wanted to, with the classical coin toss uh, experiment or with any uh, seemingly random um, process, we could, if we wanted to, uh, we could reconstruct it. It is possible in principle uh, by information theory and by um, simulation and by uh, basically tallying up all of the different variables. It is possible in principle to what to convert what is seemingly random uh, chance into uh, determinism. But in quantum mechanics, uh, determinism actually is eliminated. And this is proven by experiment, but also has been proposed, of course, by, by theory, uh, by um, uh, physicists such as John Bell, uh, who developed, of course, the famous Bell inequality, which is the gold um, standard uh, to test for um, the correlations, the cross-correlations between entangled states. Now, this setup cannot do uh, the... Whoops. Okay, so sorry for the interruption. Yes, so as I was saying, um, this setup itself can't do uh, the Bell test and uh, to determine the, whether or not the photons are correlated such that they do not satisfy uh, Bell's inequality. But there are uh, setups that do do this, and one of them, one of the famous ones, um, that's been in development for several years as well, is uh, the um, so-called NIST uh, national, uh, the American National um, Institute of Standards and Technology uh, random number uh, beacon, uh, which um, they published in back in 2018, um, results that uh, they used quantum entanglement as a uh, source for generating random numbers. And they basically used the same technique uh, as um, I'm using here. So they're um, generating random bits, ones and zeros, using photons, and the photons are generated, uh, they're entangled photons, they're generated using a nonlinear crystal by um, spontaneous parametric head down conversion. I'm not sure of what crystal they use, I'm pretty sure that they use um, uh, either beta barium borate or uh, potassium triphosphate KTP, um, which is also a um, um, crystal that is non-linear so it can basically do this uh, splitting of input uh, pump photons into uh, two separate entangled streams and they have also just to mention them they have made developments uh, they're continuing to make developments in this in the uh, generating of a uh, randomness beacon uh, they say on their their uh, the Computer Security Resource Center that um, it's not uh, available yet for use uh, use as, as secret cryptographic keys, but they are able to generate a um, time stamp, so let's say a cryptographic um, key uh, every every uh, few seconds or so. And there is a there is um, a organization that uh, uses this. Uh, it's called um, uh, Tom Tom or something like that. Uh, Tom Tom um, Quantum uh, Randomness Beacon. If you if you look up this thing, yeah. So NIST Beacon Quantum on their website. Uh, I think this is like a cryptocurrency or something like that. Uh, uh, but it, it's um, it's basically takes the data from the NIST uh, website here. I think uh, not that this one, uh, not, not this one either. The one I was at previously. Um, so if I go back a few pages, I'll show you. Yeah, so it takes this signature here 
and uh, for some reason publishes it on their website. Uh, I don't know exactly what for what purpose they're doing this, but effectively it's uh, demonstrating um, uh, the existence, let's say, of this randomness beacon as a technology using pure randomness, uh, basically. So these are pure random numbers, uh, allegedly, um, that are being generated from um, uh, quantum entanglement, uh, essentially. They're using the, the randomness beacon, and this pulse regenerates every 40 seconds. So that's effectively... Um, why I was interested in developing this myself. I've been developing this for a while, pretty much as a byproduct of my own experiments in using nonlinear crystals. So, as I said, the source is here. This is the entanglement source, and these are the two photo detectors. The, this is um, the filters I managed to use for this are relatively um, uh, cheap. You can get them on eBay. The crystal is the most expensive part. So here we have a filter and each photo detector has a filter to filter away the, um, the stray ultraviolet photons and only detect the 810 uh, nanometer photons. And to uh, show that I'm not uh, making it up, basically, if you have um, a laser here, this laser is in the range this is a commercial laser you can buy 810 nanometer lasers off ebay or aliexpress or whatever you like and they are pretty good they show the beam first of all of course whenever you're using these lasers you should always have a pair of goggles such as these laser goggles so i'll put them on and before you put on anything you should always read the instructions so the uh, prote protection, it's OD4 uh, factor, so it's able to, um, so it's quite good coverage, and the range is uh, ultraviolet, 190 nanometers to 540, so it lets green pass, uh, and then in the um, 800 to 200 nanometer range, so it's on a near infrared filter as well. So I'll put on the glasses, and I'll show you then this is an 810 nanometer laser so and this is our filter so if i switch it on you can see the beam and this filter lets the beam pass through essentially unobstructed so you can see the shadow of the filter here i'm putting the filter here the beam is not obstructed so this is 810 nanometers, and this filter lets us basically filter out, block out any light apart from 810 nanometers. And if I use a different laser in this setup, I have a even more easy to access um, red laser, a red laser here. Red laser is about 650 nanometers, 654, 650. Uh, and you can see here, the beam is very, very bright. But then when I add the filter, it essentially goes away. Okay, so 650 is blocked. Also, the other, another, the other wavelength that's important to block, and I have a laser here that can uh, show uh, that what I mean, the laser itself that's emitted will also be blocked by this filter. So these filters are relatively straightforward to buy. You can buy these off of eBay or AliExpress, as I said. Okay, so let's see how this setup actually works. So this is controlled via Arduino. So my repository here on my uh, Muon Array repository has the quantum entanglement experiments in Arduino and Python. So let's look at the code. So the code is in Python here. So Arduino. Uh, so essentially it's pretty straightforward. It does triggers the Arduino boards, this triggers the pin of the relay connected to the power supply that powers the laser. Pin 13, it has a pin for the uh, the H-mode photo detector and the V-mode photo detector. 
and assigns float, float variables to h and v. They're initially zero. And for every value that's triggered, it detects uh, the pin high or the pin low. And if, if the h uh, photo detector on a0 is greater than the v photo detector on a1, that means there's more photons in the h mode than the v mode. And if there's less uh, photons on the H mode than the V mode, then it returns a one. And if there's more, it returns a zero. Okay. And so uh, due to entanglement, um, the same number of photons are in both modes. However, the randomness is in which mode will enter the beam splitter. And there's no way to know or influence this. That's what we said. It's pure randomness. It's a perfect 50-50 coin toss, uh, as it were. Now, uh, the Arduino is, uh, code uh, has to basically communicate uh, with the um, via Python. I use Python to communicate it. And so that means the sketch file is uploaded with a value, uh, trigger value uh, or, which uh, puts an ang uh, a random, uh, the random number. You can also, um, it also has added features where it can output the code um, of the, of the, um, the angle. Uh, which is the ratio, the arc tangent of the ratio between the H and V mode. So that's not important for uh, what I want to show though at the moment. So this is the um, the um, the same code that I showed you in the Arduino uh, um, IDE, the Arduino compiler. So first of all, you should always check which um, which board we're using, the Arduino Uno. This is on COM8 this time now, so I'll switch to COM port. And that's our bootloader or whatever programmer. So if I upload the sketch, it should upload it to our um, board. So we'll see it being uploaded here in a few moments. Okay, so it's uploading there now. You can see the light flashing. Okay, so it's done uploading. So what does this do? Well, we can check on it in the serial monitor. Serial monitor can input a value of, let's say, uh, and I'll show you the video feed at the same time. So the video feed is here at the same time. And we put in a four. And what does it do? Turns the laser on, returns a zero. What does it do now? Returns the laser on and will return a random variable basically after it's finished uh, pulsing, another zero. The reason why it's returning zeros is because the um, the uh, it's exposed <laughs> pretty much. So I have to close it over in order for it to not have them um, uh, close over the suitcase, I mean. So if I close over the suitcase here, I should be able to uh, get other variables but i can experiment i can do this through a serial monitor but it's kind of a bit tedious so what i prefer to do actually is use python now python uh, is very useful because it allows me to then incorporate other scripts that i've developed and use this as a random number source for general uh, computer programming uh, computer simulation and so forth, because uh, random numbers are used quite frequently in coding, uh, and uh, they're also used in simulations, Monte Carlo simulations, also encryption uh, and uh, network uh, simulations, metaheuristics, for example. If you watched other videos on this channel, I've uh, experimented with uh, yeah, metaheuristics um, that simulate, try to simulate quantum behavior. And one good incorporation of quantum mechanics, uh, random numbers, is in these quantum simulations themselves. Uh, unless you have access to a quantum computer, you're going to be limited in what, what real realistic uh, simulations you can do. But if you have a, ran a random number source, you can actually do some uh, experiments with pure uh, randomness, the pure randomness uh, of quantum um, phenomena. So uh, the first thing I have to do here, this code as well is in my repository. But the first thing I always have to do uh, before I show you, you have to check which COM value it is. You can um, uh, change the COM value of the port to, to whatever it is on the serial monitor. Uh, but it's also important as well to the serial monitor on your own one 
one uh, program, one interface at a time, you have to switch off the serial monitor on the Arduino before you run anything on Python. So since this sketch is uploaded to save on, uh, on processing power, I can switch off the Arduino IDE here. Uh, the really, the, once you upload it, that's all you need to really worry about uh, because um, the, the uh, main guts of the programming I want to be done in Python. So as I mentioned, this is all in my repository. If I go back here, you can see this code. This, uh, there's actually two versions. This is the flush input version uh, for Python. Uh, it's, it's the same thing, except the serial, the Py serial uses uh, this um, uh, function flush input uh, rather than uh, the general serial input. Well, we can try it with both. So let's uh, do it then. The serial, uh, Py serial allows me to write then in code the um, random number generator the uh, connected to the Arduino uh, with uh, OR, which as we saw from our Arduino code then allows the value to then be interpreted by the Arduino itself and pulse the laser and return the value of the random number. So I can run it here now. And it should then output for us a series of zeros or ones, depending on pure random numbers. So random, the frequency of zeros and ones is entirely random. So we will see perhaps uh, maybe at some points more zeros and more ones or more ones and more zeros. It doesn't really make a difference, but uh, it, it really does, uh, the laser just continually pulses um, uh, and that's, that's what we see from the output. Now the flush input is different, uh, slightly different uh, than the input the out uh, from the from the laser here uh, it gives a different value and using this we can then um, use it in different simulations different uh, uh, features we can use our random numbers in so you can see there it's putting out now a string of ones and who knows, this could be followed by then a string of uh, zeros or, or something. Uh, it's entirely random. And it's impossible to know, uh, as I said before, uh, based on the initial conditions, what it will be, which one will be zero, which one will be one. Now, these are integers as well. The, they're integers between zero, uh, of zeros and ones. Uh, but maybe, perhaps, for whatever reason, we want to have... Uh, decimal values and if we want to have decimal values we have to actually uh, maybe incorporate this in um, a multiplication of some type or or, or um, there is another method for generating decimals which I've been looking into and the main method has been for um, trying to see if I can do image processing on um, detection of the uh, photons themselves so that's why I have this camera. Now, if you modify a camera, if you take out the hot mirror filter, you can see the near infrared. I learned this from experimenting with cameras for NDVI vegetation monitoring. But um, telescope and microscope cameras are usually very good. They don't have as many pixels as high-end cameras. This sensor has about 5 megapixels, 5 million pixels. But the sensor is quite large, so it can actually have, will have a high sensor gain. And using our filter here, we can, if we max out the sensor gain, the ISO, and put our filter, our 810 nanometer pass filter, on this camera, we can then begin to image the infrared photons. And by doing a comparison, by splitting the image in half and correlating, doing cross correlations, or simply doing a percentage check or a bitwise um, 
um, function on the uh, two separate halves of the image. We can, in principle, we can detect uh, the fluctuations which correspond to the uh, correlations and anti-correlations of the individual um, entangled photons. And so why is all of this uh, interesting is because it, uh, we can then use these correlations. These correlations will not be integers. Uh, they may in fact be non-integers. Uh, the ratios between the correlations and the non-anti-correlations could be non-integers. And so this is interesting because uh, it's a way to generate pure non-integers alongside the integers. Uh, and this has um, uh, interesting um, benefits because we could, in principle, with this setup, if I just show you it again, we can have the laser pulsing and we can also, with this split mirror optics, we can actually image the photons at the same time. So along with generating random numbers that are integers using Python, we can also take using this setup, using this uh, camera, we can also at the same time simultaneously uh, image the photons that are not passing through H and V modes this way, but are directly passing as uh, if this is a H mode, then the V mode will pass uh, directly into the optics. And if this is a V mode, uh, the H mode will pass directly into the, the splitter this way. And so we can image uh, the photons as well as the, and try to make some correlation with the um, the random numbers that are generated. So this can create, in principle, uh, integer random numbers and non-integer random numbers. And so all of this then is very uh, interesting, sort of, uh, I suppose, academic, but what could we use this for? Well, you can see here the random numbers are continually being generated all the time. And one thing that we could use this for, along with encryption, the, or um, uh, you know, encryption for cryptocurrencies or encryption for uh, information, who knows uh, the applications. But the main applications I'm interested in is using these in simulations. And what type of simulations? Well, the type of simulations that I'm interested in are simulations that use fractals. So uh, fractals uh, are shapes basically, which are depend on nonlinear dynamics. And some of them have very interesting shapes, but they're shapes that are generated from very simple uh, rules. Okay, so with fractals like this fractal, the fractal uh, tree of life, it is able to, or Pythagoras' fractal, it's able to generate uh, shapes such as this. Let me just uh, knock off the random number generator for a minute. So it's able to generate shapes such as this in this uh, uh, code um, that I generated in, in a Python um, graphics processor called Pygame, we're able to generate uh, very interesting fractal shapes from simple uh, rules of reiteration. So every step in this um, iteration takes a value of two lines and moves them across some angle, but it also halves them by or reduces their size by a certain amount making the, the trunk of this, uh, of this tree into branches, into ever smaller branches, into twigs and so forth. So it makes these sort of pseudo organic looking uh, shapes from very simple rules. But uh, this is sort of predictable. There's symmetry here, perfect symmetry. But what I wanted to do was I wanted to randomize these fractal like images to make them more organic. Uh, and a way in which we can do this is we can take the variables, the, let's say, the um, um, dif uh, the definitive variables, the, the classical variables of, of length and, and angle, and make them random. 
And if they're random, you'll see that they actually appear more organic than uh, the, let's say, the um, the predictable uh, shape of this of this uh, fractal tree. So, if I do, so Pygame is a library basically that you can import, you can install it, and you can use it for generating graphics. And with this tree of life uh, that I have here, I've also shared it on my GitHub as always. And you can take a look at it here on the experiments. The, I have a quantum version that I'll show you that uses the random numbers basically generated via the, the, um, the random number source we're creating. So, in our repositories, we have fractals, fractals using random numbers. I have a static version. The static version was the one I showed you, but we want to randomize some elements. Now we can randomize, we can randomize the branch length, that's easy to randomize, or we can randomize the angle, which is the angle that the uh, branches are turning towards and it turns out uh, randomizing the angle that the branches are moving towards really really creates the uh, the organic looking uh, features of these fractals so python has its own random number generator its own internal one but these are based on um, pseudo random numbers as we mentioned uh, previously if we had um, you know perfect knowledge about the internal dynamics of the computer we could um, we, we could very easily reconstruct the random number that was generated. It's not true random numbers. So, uh, but for our purposes here, I can show you what it looks like when we have a interplay, a balance between the uh, randomization of the length and of the angle uh, that the branch is turning to. And you'll see that the tree, the fractal tree, looks much more organic uh, than before. So each iteration produces a new fractal tree uh, produces new branches and you can see that they're um, they come from the same source but they're very different to one another they have different let's say histories path histories and the uh, the appearance of the trees when you see some of the enlarged ones they look more a lot more plant-like a lot more organic and um, a lot more like um, essentially as if they've been shaped by the random processes of the natural world and so that's, uh, to me, is an interesting um, result, let's say, of experimenting with random uh, randomness uh, in fractal uh, creation. Now, these are true fract. Uh, these are um, non-random. Uh, they're random, but they're not pure, pure random. They're pseudo-random fractals. What if we instead use the quantum uh, random number generator what if we use our quantum random numbers to generate the fractal uh, tree of life? So I have a code here that uses the random numbers, but in this sense, in this uh, time, I mean, it's um, the com port is, remember, eight, I think. And it communicates with the Arduino, Arduino set and returns a value of the random number. And then this random number is then fed into our simulation. And our simulation uses the random number to randomly vary the length, but also the angle. And that's why I actually, in the Arduino code, have a function in the original um, uh, script that allows for calling the, uh, the, if I look at our Arduino experiments, there is a section in the Arduino code which allows one to call the value of the angle. And what is the angle? The angle is the arc tangent of the ratio of the V modes versus the H modes. So whatever the ratio of V to H is, and just as our random number generator created, it may not be um, a it may not be um, a integer value at all. It, it will be an integer, but it may not be. Um, it it can be a different length of of an of an integer, uh, so the ratio will be different each time.
So if I turn off the, uh, let's say the classical, the deterministic uh, random number uh, version of this setup, and instead activate the quantum random number of the setup, you can we can then see along with the video feed, the laser, I can show you the laser pulsing. And then when I close over the box to have it totally isolated, I can then run the setup. So here we have our setup. Let me just shrink down the screen. So we have our setup here. And you can see the output feed from Python. So this is quantum fractal tree of life. So it should generate. Hmm. Oh, okay. Uh, so letting run run. You can see. Try to see the output of what the. So you can see here. We have our laser running. It's outputting random numbers, outputting random numbers. I'll have to close over the box for it to have the random numbers being be completely isolated as zeros and, and ones. And all right, yeah, so the the fractal tree of life um, is running, but this is the quantum version. So the quantum version of the fractal tree of life looks very similar to the uh, the pseudo random version. So it's often very it's not entirely obvious uh, which one is the quantum one and which one is the uh, the non quantum one. However, we know that our setup can generate uh, random integers, and so our random integers can be essentially. Uh, a random in integer, um, a uniform random integer between zero and one of a length uh, of a with a decimal length of two. So if we added another decimal, uh, it can it can um, random randomly uh, allocate which decimal point will be um, um, allocated to. So this random number generator is a quantum one, and this generates, um, as you can see random uh, fractals, basically fractal patterns from our tree of life uh, simulation. And so it's my hope to incorporate these random numbers into other simulation, that, uh, such as the uh, fire, metaheuristic fireflies and um, the other network synchronization uh, simulations as well that use basically quantum numbers. And it's my ultimate goal to have the setup, uh, if I just switch it off uh, for a second, uh, it's my it's my goal to have the um, basically the the setup uh, like the NIST beacon uh, accessed on the internet. I want it to be uh, I want the um, the random numbers to be published, updated every sixty seconds, and to put them on an Ethernet um, and to put them on a server. And using an Ethernet shield connected with the Arduino, I want to have uh, the entire. Um, setup that I have have here uh, here if I show you so hopefully I'll be able to with a bit few more updates and using an Ethernet shield uh, I'll be able to connect the Arduino Uno um, connected with this setup to the internet and using the external power supply uh, power the Arduino essentially free uh, from um, my laptop so I could have this running say in the background and using the random numbers uh, generated via um, this setup, I could put it basically as my own um, uh, open source uh, beacon, quantum random number beacon for use in experimentation and so on. I mean, the random numbers generated are useful, they're interesting to experiment with, to play around with, and the fact that we have the knowledge that they're generated via a quantum entanglement source is very uh, interesting at least uh, to me and well I can of course do comparisons with the NIST uh, random beacon as well and
this will then follow following on from this i'll then try to um, make more progress on imaging photons uh, generated from this source so hopefully in the next video i'll be able to show um, some photo photographs basically of the entangled photons are being captured by the CCD sensor uh, here, this CCD sensor uh, that I'm trying to incorporate into uh, this setup where it can image using the split screen, uh, the entangled photon beams and from um, these entangled photon beams and um, do cross correlations using Python uh, image processing, basically using um, OpenCV and trying to see if I can do uh, even some even some bitwise uh, gate operations on them. Uh, you can do bitwise um, and or or ZOR. Uh, the bitwise ZOR um, is something that I definitely want to experiment with with regards to quantum imaging because um, it's actually been shown on papers um, uh, that you can do some um, some kind of um, you know sub shot noise imaging with um, this uh, technique. Okay, so I hope to update give more updates on this project soon uh, with particular interest in making the quantum random number beacon uh, available online to, in a sense, uh, compete with the NIST uh, random number beacon. Okay, so be sure to check out this channel for more updates on this project. It's something that I've been working on, as I said, on and off for a few years, and I hope to be able to share um, this progress with you all very soon. Okay, thank you.